I, I remember years ago, and, and let me explain a little bit what witchcraft is and why God hates it so bad. It's in several lists are called the no-no lists in the Bible. And it's in several lists. One of them where God says, thou, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And that's in Ezekiel, uh, Exodus. As he's giving the law from Mount Sinai, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And in Deuteronomy 18, witchcraft, wizardry, necromancy, um, enchanters, things like that. All of that goes together. God said, I do not want you doing that. I'll, I'll put you to death. Um, and then as the works of the flesh. And this is really what, this is really gets me. In fact, turn to, uh, turn to uh, Galatians. Turn to Galatians 5. Because this is, to me, really what witchcraft is part of. And this is the connection that I make with, if I say to you tonight that there is witchcraft being done in churches all over the world, I mean what I say. In, in Galatians chapter 5, we have, in verse 22, we have the fruit of the Spirit. The nine fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. There's nine of them there. Nine's the number for fruit-bearing. A woman carries a baby in her womb for nine months, and so on and so on. First thing out of God's mouth in Genesis 9 was he tells Noah and every, every animal in the earth, be fruitful and multiply. And, and the phrase, be fruitful, guess how many times it's in the Bible? Nine. Nine times, okay? The fruit of the womb of Mary was Jesus, right? And, and Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost. The phrase Holy Ghost is 90 times in the King James Bible. How old was Sarah when she gave birth to Isaac? 90. I just like that stuff. So anyway... Before you have the fruit of the Spirit, you have the works of the flesh. And there's 18 of them, 9 times 2. And here's the, here's the works of the flesh. Um, if we start verse 18, but if you led, be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Then he says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. The first four deal with sexual sins, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Number five is idolatry. So, way to go, bub! And look at that next one. The sixth one is what? Witchcraft is a, is a work of the flesh. Okay? So, witchcraft is defined as any ritual... Any religious ritual that is designed to manifest forces, either forces of darkness or what some people say are forces of light, but they're designed to bring forth and manifest forces that will, that will give favor to those who have performed the ritual. Now, how many rituals do we have in our Bible? How many places does it say, if we do this, and if we do this, and if we do this, and if we do this, then God will do this? Or God must do this? Okay? Does it say that I have to do this before each time we pray or if I give you a blessing that I must do my hands like this? Is there anything like that in the Bible? Nothing. Uh, is there anything where if I hold my fingers like this and give you the same kind of blessing, is there anything in the Bible that tells you that? No. Okay? The closest things that we have to any form of rite or ritual 
is, of course, baptism. And there's no, there's no script in the Bible that says how we're to do it other than immersion. Because Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch came up out of the water. Uh, John was baptizing in the River Jordan. If he was just sprinkling everybody, he could have done it in the city fountain and just put a cup in, over everybody's head. But no, they was doing it in the River Jordan. Immersion shows what Romans chapter 6 tells us. We are buried with him by baptism. That's going down under the water. So as far as ritual, what about taking the Lord's Supper? Is there, is there a... A written format in the Bible for how we must take the Lord's Supper. No, none of it. There's nothing there. So, you know, I ask people this question about, especially charismatics, who say that you don't have what we have because you don't have enough faith to get it. You didn't say the, you said negative words and, and therefore you got negative things in your life. You, you said that you were going to die. No wonder you're going to die. You told God you were going to die and you have to die now. Wait a minute. I've been alive now 56 years. I couldn't tell you how many times I think I'm going to die. And I haven't died yet. I have things... That God has blessed me with that I've never asked for. Never performed a ritual over nothing. So, something led me. I mean, I spent all day. I was working on this yesterday in preparation for going down there. And uh, I worked all day on this. And um, again, when I go upstairs to try to find my PowerPoint, it ain't here. Nothing but rituals designed to force God. God only will do it if it said it in Latin. And there had, there was, there was this ecumenical movement thing in 1963, the Second Vatican Council, which finally allowed for the mass to be said in the languages of the people so they could understand it. But it was still the idea that they had to say these words to make God act upon this bread and this wine to turn it literally into the flesh and the, and the blood of Jesus Christ. So, I don't know what led me to it, but I watched two different Lutheran services that were on YouTube. And I was struck. I did not know that in a Lutheran service, the Lutheran priest forgives your sins just like a Catholic priest does. I did not know that. Now, years ago, I went to a Catholic funeral. And it was some friends that we had met years ago. They were very... Um, they did a lot in Missouri politics as far as family and faith was concerned. And um, I think at one time he may have been uh, part of the Missouri Congress... But anyway, their son died in, a, I think it was a car crash or something like that. And so I went to the funeral. funeral. It was a Lutheran church. And I could, I'm not going to say which one it was. But I walk into this church, first time I've ever been in a Lutheran church. And I see up on the stage this big statue of Jesus. And I'm going, you're not supposed to do that. You're just not supposed to do that. So I'm going... Well, okay. So then the service starts. And the two candle boys come walking down and they light candles. Then you hear the priest come in from the back. And he's reading a prayer. 
Now, does the Bible tell us anywhere to read a prayer? Okay? Does the Bible tell us anywhere that we must have a certain service on a certain day? Because that's what I heard from, from both of these Lutheran services. Now, we'll be using service number 408 in your Lutheran him whatever whatever lutheran book they had or they would print the service and everything that was to be said uh by number one by the priest and then the people would respond by saying this all that was printed in the bulletin and i'd heard you know preaching years ago about how church services have to follow the bulletin and i'm going our bulletin just has like stuff in it that the church is going to do next month i never understood that until I watched that and, I, and they literally have what the priest is going to say. They literally have what you are going to say. So I'm at this funeral and I see this priest coming in and he's reading this prayer. And it's from a, a book of rituals that they have. And he's walking down the center aisle. He walks up on the stage and he bows before the statue reading the prayer. And I'm going, okay, that's wrong. That is exactly what God said. Don't do this in the Ten Commandments. Let it be written, so let it be done. That was what Yul Brenner said. And Helen sent me that the other day. I knew exactly what it was. You didn't have to tell me. That was, I knew exactly. So let it be written, so let it be done. But anyway, he's reading this prayer to this statue, and I'm going, that's, the, that's breaking the commandment. There's no way this is right. So I'm watching these two Lutheran services yesterday, and both of them are pretty much the same. The minister tells everybody, or the priest tells everybody, what, what service ritual they're going to be using. And what prayers they're going to be saying because they're all written out and they do that and then the priest turns around and has this reading with a responsive and a responsive reading where the priest will say words the people will say words and it has to do with god forgiving their sins and then the priest says uh, by the authority of the vestment given to me by the Holy Ghost, I forgive your sins and bind them here on this earth. And he does this and he forgives everybody's sins. I'm going, that's witchcraft. It's witchcraft. It is a set of rituals that are designed to force God to forgive your sins and in actuality, how many people in that church who said the words are actually sorry for their sins? If that's all you believe is that you have to go to the service and say the words and your priest forgives you, are you, are you forgiven? No, because only godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation not to be repented of. And I was just like, that's witchcraft. It's a work because what did, what did uh, Paul say in Ephesians 2, 8, 9? For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works. Works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, witchcraft. And uh, Lord, please help me have those notes when I get home. All right, now Genesis 28. That didn't take long, did it? Um, but that's just, that's just a, a portion uh, of what I'm going to be teaching down there. G Genesis 28. 
Jacob went out from Beersheba, went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place, tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Uh, now, I'm going to throw something in here that is a false doctrine. Um, a few years ago, uh, we were in my office talking about when Elizabeth II died, there was a soccer game going on in Scotland. And what were they yelling, John? Huh? Lizzie's in a box, Lizzie's in a box. The, the Scottish people want a Scotland that is free from England. Okay? Several years ago, um, England gave back to Scotland a stone. It's about this big. And uh, what's the name of the stone? Stone of Scone or something like that. But this stone sat under the throne whereupon the monarchs of England were crowned. Now, I don't know if they're going to bring this stone back for King Charles to sit upon that stone. But the belief is, is that that stone is the stone that Jacob used for his pillow. Saying, and, and what that means to them is this is God giving his divine blessing upon the monarch of England because here's the stone that Jacob set up for his pillow. Now, how do we know whether that's true or not from the Bible? Actually, we can. Let's look at it again. He lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took of the stones, plural, of that place and put them for his pillows. How many stones did he have? Had to be more than one. Had to be more than one. He just collected a bunch of rocks, built them up, probably put some sort of soft cloth on them and used that for his pillow that night and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. We call that Jacob's ladder, and that's the story that it comes from. Um, where is... Here it is. Turn to John chapter 1. That ladder, we find out, is Jesus. I mean, there is only one way to ascend to heaven, is there not? John chapter 1. Who remembers a song? I'm, I'm being silly here. But who remembers the song called Stairway to Heaven? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know it. What are the, what's the last words of that song? What's the last verse of that song? It, the song is about a lady. The song is about a lady. And the last part of that song is, and she's buying your stairway to heaven. Okay? So do you understand the occult or the, 
the satanic difference. If this ladder is Christ, then the song Stairway to Heaven speaks of an alternative way to get to heaven, and it's through this lady, this mysterious lady, who is buying your stairway to heaven. There's a reference in there to the May Queen. Okay? I mean, everybody knows the tune to the song, but did you ever really listen to the words? Okay? The words were written by an occultist. Okay? John chapter 1, verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith, Apparently, Nathanael didn't have a high opinion of people from Nazareth. Philip saith unto him, Come and see. In verse 47, Now, Jesus is about to change Nathanael's mind. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith unto him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael must have been a man of truth. A man who not only told the truth in his life and lived the truth in his life, but... Jesus knew that he would believe the truth. And he says in him, Behold a man in whom is no guile. That, you know what that is? Turn to uh, Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Jesus just, I believe, I just thought of this. This just in from, from heaven. Jesus just declared Nathaniel's salvation. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no what? Guile. Guile means deception. It means lying. The serpent, that's what Eve said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So when Jesus, I think when Jesus said this to Nathaniel, I think he was declaring his salvation. Uh, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Verse 48, Nathaniel said, saith unto him, whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathaniel's just blown away. How does this guy know me? Nathaniel answered and saith unto him, Rabbi. What does the word rabbi mean? Huh? Master. Master. Um, the rabbis were teachers. Um, but I think the meaning of the word is master. Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. See, he instantly believes now. Because Jesus told him, I see a man in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, in verse 50, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And compare that with what we just saw in Genesis 28. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, 
the top of it reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of, of God. Same, same wording here. Angels of God ascending and descending on it. Angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So who is that ladder? That ladder is Christ. It's great to have a New Testament to show us. It's like I was preaching this morning. The Jews are partly blind. They would look at this story and never understand it. Not without reading John. Would they ever understand it? Now, I, I like to do this because that's what we're made of. That is a picture of the Son of Man, the Son of God, our DNA. And it's made of sugar because the Word of God is sweet, sweeter than honey. And it's also made of phosphate. Phosphate, phosphorus, tracer rounds. You know about tracer rounds, don't you? Dip every, what is it, every fourth, every fourth bullet in phosphorus so that when you're shooting at night, it makes a straight line of light. It's like having a laser and you can tell what you're shooting at because the phosphorus lights up as it goes out the end of the barrel of a gun. So your, the book of your DNA is literally made of light. It's made of light. And angels are ministers of light. Of, they're made of fire, which is light. So literally, in your DNA, you have... <laughs> this is so cool. When your body is going to make... Let's see, a, a, a skin cell. Okay, you need a skin cell because some of your skin cells... Your house, all the house dust, 80% of that is skin cells. It's you living there. Okay? So your body needs to make a new skin cell. So you know what happens? The DNA, it's wrapped up like, it's rolled up like a scroll. Well, it unrolls, and when it unrolls, it looks like a ladder. And then it's rightly divided. It splits down the middle. And there is a mechanism in there that reads one half of that piece of DNA and makes a copy of it. And that copy of that DNA, do you know what it's called? Messenger RNA. You know what the word angel means? Messenger. You literally have angels, messengers, constantly ascending and descending your DNA, looking for genes of things that your body needs to make to keep yourself alive. Isn't that something? I love this stuff. Ah, move on. It's almost time to go. In verse 28, or chapter, or chapter 28, verse 12. He dreamed a dream, behold, a ladder set up on the earth and top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Jacob, Jacob doesn't even really fully understand what he's seeing. I mean, we have a better comprehension now than anybody else in history. Sure, in previous days, they, could, they would understand that's Jesus, that's John chapter 1, when he sees Nathaniel, the angels of God ascend. But now that we know what we know about DNA, we know that it goes even beyond that. But Jacob is so impressed by this. By the way, let me say this as well. One of the key Masonic emblems 
from Freemasonry is a ladder. It's called the Masonic Ladder. There's actually a book in Google Books, books.google.com, and it's called the Masonic Ladder. It's from the 1800s. It's free download. But there is an emblem in masonry. In some cases, it has seven rungs. In some cases, it has only three. But it's a ladder that reaches from the earth to the heavens. And in masonry, what it does is that it connects what's on earth to what's in the heavens. And in masonry, they believe that your good works give you the right to ascend the ladder so that you can go into the celestial kingdom of God. Okay? And it's works. Salvation is what it is. It has nothing to do with Christ. It has everything to do with the works of a mason. Okay? So then... In verse 14, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. And the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And what is that? It's seed. It's DNA. Okay? That's your seed. That's what you're made of. That's what your children are made of, that's how they got here, and so on. And to thy seed, in verse 14, And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. How many directions? Four. What did God say to Abraham in Genesis 13? Look northward, southward, eastward, westward. All that thine eyes shall see, I will give to thee. Why? Because God said, Bless Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. How far does east go? Until it runs into west. How far does north go? Until you start going down. Then you're headed south. It's the entire and and in thee. Now look at this. In thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That is the same blessing that God gave to Abraham, his grandfather. In thee shall all the nations or the families of the earth be blessed. In thee and in thy seed. And thy seed is Jesus Christ. He is the one that blesses whether we are white people from America, black people from Kenya or Africa, yellow people from Asia, red people from the North and South Americans, doesn't matter. All over the world, the seed of Jacob has blessed every nation and every family of the world. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now, um, Jacob did not die in this land. Where did Jacob die? Anybody know? In Egypt. Thank you very much. And what did they do with his bones? They carried them back to this land. Because God said. I will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And they made sure they carried Jacob's bones back into that land. To be buried in the cave of Machpelah. With Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. In verse 16, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. If I were to go back and say, look at that. Surely the Lord is in that place. 
mm, mm, mm. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And he's referring to Christ, that ladder. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Beth means house. El is part of El Ohim. It means God. But the name of the city was called Luz at the first. And the word Bethel is found 66 times in the Bible. King James Bible. So I don't have a problem with what my forefathers in this church named this church. Because it had different names before 1968. It, there was actually a split in the 60s, and they came back together again in 1968 and formed a new church and called it Bethel Free Will Baptist Church. So now we're just Bethel Church. Let's stand to our feet.